Hi, I'm your host, Johnny Wilkinson, and welcome to this episode of I Am. There are coaches everywhere nowadays, in business, in sport, happiness coaches, there's life coaches too. There's just about a coach for everything. Some, though, seem to have access to a secret dimension of wisdom. They just seem to know the answers. These ones we call gurus. My guest this week is Dr. Dave Allred, and for me during my career, he was exactly that, a total guru. In this chat with Dave, I get a chance to finally explain what a difference he made to me, and he also gets to let me know some of the secrets behind those methods of his. And if you want to hear more, then do head over to the Tuesday episode just before this one. These Thursday episodes are just for the guests, though. I feel they have so much to offer, so much possibility and opportunity in what they're they're, they're talking about what they've been through and it's a great chat so I don't want to waste any more time on me thanks so much for listening I'm your host Johnny Wilkinson welcome to I Am Dr. Dave Allred an absolute pleasure to have you on the I Am podcast thanks so much for joining us mate how are you? yeah not too bad not too bad good. yeah I'm, I'm firmly ensconced in the UK at the moment Good. May always good to have you with us. So obviously for me, you, you've been a huge influence. We're going to cover some of that, but also I want to get into really picking those those brain cells of yours and, and getting some of that genius, getting access to that genius. So I know you obviously as a coach, but for all of those listening who may not uh, know you like I do, can you give us a little bit of a background as to what it is you do, what your speciality is, what your passion is, and also how it came about for you? Yeah, it, basically, I, I love coaching. I love the challenge of taking people where they've never been before. And I love taking people when they never thought they could get there either, which is a real buzz of mine. And it usually means that I've broken down a lot of limiting beliefs that they've had. And where that started, I, I kind of was involved when rugby was amateur, way back with Bath, with Stuart Barnes and Jonathan Webb were the, kind of the first two and then I worked with Rob Andrew and, and so it went on and then populated with that I was lucky enough to go on the 97 Lions tour and then the th a couple of tours after that as well and then coach with England with Clive Woodward but all the time I, I, I was having this urge to how can we get better and I think it started that I had a kind of eureka moment I, I trained as a PE teacher and taught in inner city comprehensive schools and in one school in particular I had a particularly challenging group of individuals who didn't want to be there the school had nothing to offer them basically it was just you know keep them quiet and 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 that'll do but these these people I learned quite quickly just by observing other teachers and the kind of shouting and stuff that went on, that kind of respect in its generic sense had gone out of the window. Now, I'm not saying there was disrespect, but I, I, I kind of found very quickly that if I just talked to them as people, not as teacher, student, and asked them about, you know, bits and pieces, what the weekend and what work they were doing and that. And I found very quickly that if I kept that model of being next to them when I taught, I actually got a lot more response. And the kind of metaphor that I've used so much so that it's habit now, and I don't even think about it, even when I'm coaching, very rarely, if I'm coaching with individuals, do I coach in front of somebody? I don't tell them, give them orders and all the rest of it. I try and coach next to them. And so metaphorically, we're looking at the person's performance as a third party. And then we can both have input and we can both be objective. And I found that, although I probably didn't articulate it that way then, that when a few other things which illustrated my respect, like a simple thing of getting in the classroom that I was there for 24 periods a week, I actually put up some coat hooks. So instead of the kids throwing it on the back and if it was wet, it'd be on the floor and so on, they could hang their coats up. 
And a little thing like that, suddenly I was kind of on side. And what I did find was that if there was episodes of disruptive behaviour, it was the group themselves that dealt with it, not me. And then, and then from there, it was this whole thing about, you know, everybody can improve. And, and that was my kind of train that I got on. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I actually, I still can't get off it. Well, I recognize that hugely because I was on the receiving end of a lot of that kind of inspiration, if you like. And when you're talking there, you mentioned a couple of things, breaking down limiting beliefs. And you also mentioned about that immediate respect. And I think something that I've started pondering a little bit about coaching is that the idea that from a coach's perspective, you ask, what is it you really want from your team or from your player or from whoever it is that you're working with? And the answer is, I want the best of them. I want them to, to bring out their best. But the next question is, do you know what that is? Because if you do, it's a very dangerous space to be in. And I think the idea about someone's potential, if you know what it is, it's not their potential. You've put a limit on it. Yeah, I agree. And I think that for me, that respect is huge. Yeah, well, I think that you're right to say, do I know somebody's potential? No, I don't. But it's better than they are now. And that's yeah. all That's all that matters. Yeah. And, and there is a journey that we go on. And I try and say that even to the golfers, you know, we're not aiming to win tournaments. We're aiming to get on a journey of constant, consistent improvement that you're better than your previous self. And on the way to doing that, you will start winning tournaments. I know, mate, with you, often we had sessions and I would get that kick, that massive kind of almost surge of, of something, like a revelation. But what I got sometimes caught up with with I took the drill and I took the physical and I went and hammered at the drills we were doing and then obviously you become very good at doing the drills but you lose the search yeah and you realize yeah. that that having you there and this was always the case was saying that's why there's always going to be a role for great coaches no matter how great the, the the player gets is that having you there was the process of releasing me from that yeah identification or that attachment to the answer is the drill but in fact actually the answer was the the feeling of yeah. us being together that yeah. sense of anything is possible yeah yeah i think and i think that's really important and it, what what i do find interesting is that both in golf and in rugby it's quite relevant that it's i think if you are obsessed with the drill you're automatically obsessed with the outcome and what i find is that that I have to be there, particularly when there's an intensity, and you all appreciate this, Johnny, you know, that it's, it's all very well enjoying ourselves today, but, you know, in two days' time, we've got a test match. But despite all that, I have to reinforce what is going well. I have to almost get you to stop and go, hey, do you realise what we've just achieved? And I, I, I've got two times one i think you will remember and the other one i thought well you probably both remember <laughs> is in twickenham and we were doing this was on the, on the sort of the comeback trail or the better than we were before trail yeah, which one which one are you talking <laughs> about? and we were doing drop goals of uh, right and left foot and we were on the 22 and they said right okay let's just put the cones out let's go a little bit further and i eventually got you without realizing it particularly okay right now we're just going to do five and five on these two here okay and it was on the 40. and we hit five with the right five with the left drop goals from 40 meters out and you got every single one and because of the kind of the uh, you, you'll appreciate this the surge within the session I had to stop you and say, do you realize what you've just done? Yeah. And, and I know that it's sometimes difficult in those kind of environments, but that's really, really important. And I find myself saying that more and more now because people are so, in today's world, either they don't go there or they're scared of making mistakes. So I, I have to drown them with enthusiasm, but the enthusiasm has to be substantiated in fact. And the other one was, I don't know if you can remember it, you were on the bench 
We, we were playing away against France. I was in my puss on non grata with the RFU going through the, the surges, but I didn't have to wear a baraclava. And I was at, at, at Penny Hill and we did narrow angles. I remember it well. At, I remember at, both of these moments yeah, very, very well. Good. I'm, and you did four from the right and three from the left and the one that missed hit the post. And that was narrow, narrow. So that was actually back yeah. on the five. And I remember the game, you were on the bench, but within about seven or eight minutes to go, you came on and it was a kick on the halfway, about 15 metres. It was about five metres in from town. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. And I, and, and all the commentators are going, oh dear, dear, dear. And it was on television. I was watching on television. I was actually going, what's difficult about that? That's the size of a barn door compared with what we did yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you absolutely nailed it. And I just suddenly thought then, you know, that's why we do it. Yeah. Y you know, and people don't really understand those things. It's actually the iceberg that's underneath where the, all the work and the effort really goes on. So those two occasions, and I'm still today, even more so now, spending time finding out what people are doing right to start with. Yeah, brilliant. And I think that surge and that feeling side of the session, and I don't want to take away from all the work that went into understanding and learning technique and everything like that and, ex and exploring, continue to explore physical technique. But when that feeling is in place and it's connected all the way down, it's not a kind of, uh, there's parts of me that you know, don't feel so good, but I feel kind of good and I'm going to tell myself I feel good. It's an all the way through. Yeah, I feel fantastic. And I equate that to the feeling of absolute worthiness, that you deserve whatever it is you dream of. Yeah. And so when you're looking at that ball on the tee, instead of, you know, going through the process of, right, you're going to visualize what the ball's going to do and where it's going to go. You don't need to because you're already dreaming it yeah. because you feel so good. Your whole life is about dreaming your next moment. And I want to sort of explore this a little bit with you, but that, that feeling of just immenseness within for me has been the secret of so much performance. And I remember so many of our sessions. One is that it's not a straight curve. It doesn't just go good yeah. day, better day, great yeah. day, amazing day, best day ever. Yeah. It goes, oh, what was that? Where did that come from? Yes. But when you look at the big picture of the curve, the curve is amazing. But when you narrow in on it and you get the, you know, the microscope on it, day to day, moment to moment, it's up and down. Yeah, there's a lot of little lumps on that. And that for me was the point of every session we did, almost to get to that, that feeling place. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you articulated it in that way, because now I spend, you know, you, back in the in the days when we were working, I know there wasn't quite such a demand on the physical, but there was always issue about groins and hamstrings and all that kind of stuff. And you shouldn't kick so many and you spend too long at it. But people didn't realize that the length of time, it's not the length of time, it's the number of kicks and blah, blah, blah. And it's the length of the kick and so on. And I've now started with all the players now that I'm working with for just go and hit 40%, 40% effort, perfectly hit into a fence. So that I've even taken accountability out of it other than strike and line. And I've noticed now, even a young lad, Nate Bartnett, and another young lad in the UK here, Thomas Taylor, they're, they're kind of almost coming at one with the ball. They just drift in and let it happen. And, and that foundation now, A, helps to kick with both feet because of the flow. And it's about whole body and posture and not about leg and not about power and not about line all the time. And, and I'm kind of adding that on now with the mental side of matching intention. And the interesting thing is that to match your intention, you have to have a very vivid visualization to start with. Otherwise, you don't know whether you've matched it or not. And it, it's quite fascinating how people have just taken to it. Yeah. And I think you mentioned about limiting beliefs in there. I think there is one in there. We've explored this in some of the other podcasts because we're obviously looking at human potential and, and the ability to manifest and create. And the first thing that comes into the head when you have that from a belief standpoint is you have to go out and slog. 
because in order to make things happen, you have to, there's only one way to do it. You've got to exhaust yourself and, and, and you lose sense of that ability that actually there's a, there are other dimensions at play. Yes. And getting focused on that physical level that it becomes very much a formula of I do this and I get this is like, yes, but there's a deeper level that says, I think this, I do this, I get this, I feel this, and then I do this and get this. But then ultimately it comes down, I am this. Yeah, yeah. I just am the kick I'm about to take. And that process does take time, I think, and work, but it's it's an, an enjoyable process of ever deepening understanding. But for me, there were times when, you know, I'd mentioned that one session, I screamed at you in the car on the way back from we were training at Sandhurst when, and it got dark before I was ready to finish which means we'd probably been at it two hours anyway. <laughs> and you, you were trying to say to me, let's just go in front from 10 yards out and just smash a few, which was a beautiful idea, mate. I was having none of it because you'd set me a task to hit from wide out and, and or, or that was the idea rather. And I was, I couldn't do it. It was getting dark. The pitch was heavy and I just wasn't quite there. And God, I had, the belief was if I don't sort this out yeah. before tomorrow, something's gone, something's wrong. The weekend's gone. But sure enough, in the car on the way home, after about half the journey was pure <laughs> silence, half the journey was you trying to make small talk, and whatever was left was suddenly a realisation that there is tomorrow. Yeah, and the sun and is actually, still going to come up. And the sun is still going to but also not just that, that all that experience would unravel itself in my favour yeah. the following day, if I allowed it, yes. if I was willing to open up to say, it's not just worth it, it was meant to be. Yeah, but it, it, it's the the other thing that I found fascinating in terms of skill development, and and this I picked up a lot more in golf because the the edges are so finite, and particularly in the short game area, is that even if if you mentally prepare to do something, and you don't quite match your intention, the brain still learns. And it's really important that people need to understand that if they mentally commit, they will learn. And, and ironically, if I said to you, how many times have you tried and tried to do something and then you kind of, well, I'm not going to be able to do that. And then you just do it. And there's no rhyme or reason. Why can I do it today? And I couldn't do it yesterday. It's because the brain has finally caught up and allowed you to learn it and allow the learning to go through your whole body. And that, I found that so many times, which is why I have to reinforce that with people that I'm working with. And I said, look, don't worry about it. I just want you to mentally commit and it will get there. And, and, and although it's sometimes fighting a few choice phrases and colorful um, expletives from the player, I'm saying, you have to trust me on this. And then eventually they say, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I get it now. But if you don't commit, then it won't work. And that's the angsty bit. I have to commit and eventually it will work. Yeah. And, and I, I look at that, I guess, from my perspective in that as long as there's energy and intention, it's on its way. And I guess they're almost the same thing, you know, attention and energy. If there's energy and intention, it's something you care about. There's direction, there's meaning, there's purpose, there's desire. Now, even if there's desire heading the other way, there's still energy. And you can sort of, like you said, you can work to shape it and move it and bring it into alignment. But actually, if there's no energy and no intention, that for me is the is the only place where it's difficult to get the yeah. The improvement. And, and, I, and I think one of the things, and this is particularly relevant for the youngsters who have lower self-esteem, is I am not going to spend my energy on something I might fail at. And although it, it doesn't manifest itself quite so obvious, it still has a place in professional sports. And I'm saying, look, you know, it doesn't matter. Let's just get a few bits right and we'll build onto it gradually. And, and I find I'm desperately trying to destroy this negative avoidance where people would really focus on not making a mistake rather than trying to achieve. 
and and that's a big bit of finding the bits that were yeah that was really good that was fine okay don't worry it came off the side of your foot but your shoulder position was outstanding and 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 i keep building on what they've achieved and then add what they need to do differently rather than what they need to improve on which is kind of old money coaching because once you use words like improve and standards then there's above and below and if i'm not particularly good i'm below standard and if i'm not careful i become a below standard player even yeah. even though we're looking at one particular aspect so i'm i'm very conscious of both the language but also you know finding what's right first before anything else yeah i think for me that that i i went on both those journeys at times in my life and my career especially on the one hand moving towards what you want and moving away from what you don't do not end up in the same place <laughs> yeah one of them one of them goes into brand new space, into surprise, into inspiration, into amazing growth. And the other one is a blind reactive journey. It's almost like you've got your back to, to everyone. And I understand that. And, and I, and I know this is what you mean your negative avoidance in the language you're talking about, about everything beginning with, look, don't worry about that. And don't, try not to think about this versus, well, w- what do we want to be thinking about? Where do we want to be going? Yeah. The worry that I have with negative avoidance and the language that's kind of wrapped around that is very quickly, it's whatever happens, guys, don't make a mistake. And what people naturally do is kind of retreat in their comfort zone, not for ease, but for security. Right. I'm going to make sure every pass goes to hand and I'm only going to pass the ball four feet because I can make the four foot pass all day long. So I'll do that. And, and I remember a soccer player and I was there doing some work with some goalkeepers and he was at the top and he came down and said, look, I'd like to join in because I like my ball striking. I could really improve on. Anyway, he worked on his ball striking and, and I actually said, mate, how have you played for so many years and you can't hit a backspin drive 30 meters straight he said the one thing i learned about soccer very very quickly is number one don't make a mistake if you look at my stats i'm a great passer of the ball it never gets intercepted because i don't pass it very far it's all side foot. I make sure right. if the ball needs a long clearance, I'll give it to somebody else to take a long clearance. And, and I'm saying, well, isn't that an indictment of the game? And, it, and he just smiled. But it, that to me was fascinating how somebody can be so brilliantly successful and be so limiting. And I think, so I'm going to position this. I keep coming back to this limiting beliefs idea because when I'm four or five years old, I can't get enough of anything. I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at my left foot, which I was born left sided, I guess, from a kicking perspective. And I'm looking at it thinking, this is so much fun. And I hold the ball and I put it over my right foot and think, I wonder if I can do it this side. And it's just, I wonder if I can do this. I wonder what happened if I did it. I wonder if I can. And it's all just exploration. And then I, I liken that to being 18 years old, joining a premiership rugby club. And I'm the same thing. I wonder what it'd be like to be this. I wonder if I could do that. And I'm looking at other players thinking, I wonder if I could do that. But then fast forward seven or eight years, once you've won a few things and the media use your name a bit and people have had their opinions on you. And I'm now saying, you can't do that. You should never do that. No one should do that. No, that person over there is not good enough, not working hard enough. They're not professional enough. The stress and the pressure, the expectation. Suddenly that's all I can talk about. Now, at some point, in that journey everything around me sort of circumstantial is pretty much the same i have a pitch i have a ball i actually have more skills than i ever had yeah but for some reason all i can see now is the pitfalls and i would liken it to the fact that when i was in that younger space i was creative i was inspired i was looking to manifest the most incredible and let it go where it goes and suddenly then later on i'm just surviving I'm saying I have something of value now 
in me and I can't let anything touch it. And so therefore what I'm going to do is play it largely safe. I kept saying this to you, I'm sure, is that I felt at times like I played most of my career between six and eight because at least I felt like it won't drop below six. Whereas if I shoot for the stars, I could also fall to the ground. And as a result, I stayed between six and eight the entire time that I did that. And I'm wondering in that limiting belief, you mentioned about it doesn't matter, but that isn't the same voice we're getting everywhere else in society. I, I agree. And I think this is where good coaches and good coaching environments do take the shackles off those players. And, and there is an expectation that, you know, you're going to have a go. We're going to, we, we have to keep improving. We have to keep pushing the envelope. We can't have a squad of players that are all playing between eight and six. Now we've got talented players and all our players playing at 80% are going to be enough to win most of our games. Well, that then you'll suddenly get somebody that's a bit special, somebody that actually picks players up that kind of don't fit the norm, but ignite an environment. It's a thing that keeps you fresh. It's, it's a thing that you say, you know, I wonder if I could do this. Okay, what do you need to do to be able to do it? Right, what can we do already that's quite similar? Now, what do we need to do differently? And, and there should be just a, a kind of matter of fact about it that we just keep on going. And this is my whole thing about people should be pleased and enthusiastic to really try and get better than their previous self. That's their biggest competitor is my position last week. That where am, am I better this week? And then I'm learning and I'm exploring which is probably the most powerful combination you could have. And, and I would love to trace Cristiano Ronaldo's career and why was he so special and, and, you know, why was he such a good kicker? Well, there's a number of reasons why technically he's very sound. His posture was outstanding. His technique was brilliant. He actually used his body to have most of his power source, land on his kicking foot, etc., etc., etc. So there are a lot of technical things that make him very good. But what was it that drove him to keep practicing those free kicks, to keep practicing the things that are considered outrageous? But yeah. for him, it's just the next, the next step. And to somebody who is, whatever he is, 36, 37, and still looking to achieve, I think is exemplary and, and should be, other people should be looking at that and going, well, why not me? Yeah, I think why not me is a great call. And I think also that constant exploration, because from my perspective, you take six to eight or 60 to 80% of what you just had the next week you take 60 to 80 percent of your 60 to 80 percent yes and the next week and you're getting smaller and this is what yeah. it feels like yeah. and people call this getting old in life <sighs> it's the same thing it's it's in a career you feel like you're you're not improving and you're getting smaller or you're becoming less impactful or less influential yeah. in life people say oh, it's just life you get older but when you're exploring you're young yeah it's still it's growth it's exciting and i think that ability to explore for me for example was the shackles and I'll, I'll use the same analogy i guess again is that you, you we had a drill that i still really revert to now it stands the test of time beautifully and that you'd say right yeah yeah I, I get the kicking stuff but just put the ball down turn around walk away from the ball don't do all the kind of three back four to the yeah. side stand with that crazy hands together stuff just just walk away and when you feel ready even if you're you know, five football fields away. Yeah. <laughs> just, just turn around, just turn around and just jog in and hit it. And my word, every time you do that, you look at the kick and go, <gasps> and every kicker that I do this with says to me, I should just do that in the game. Yeah. And you say, <laughs> yes, but what you'll do is you'll make the same issue out of it because then you'll start measuring your steps exactly, away. Exactly. That's how right. You yeah. Turn. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the shackles off idea is what 
you use the question to say, okay, so yeah, that took one minute to get you into an inspired space where you've surprised the hell out of yourself. Yes. And just, yeah. and to think you've got all week before the game. So imagine yeah. what you could do with all week. I know. And then, <laughs> and then you turn up before the game and you're kind of like, I can't move. I'm so tense. That's right. So, I can't That's move. Right. I feel so restricted. Yeah. You know, is it about challenging in every moment, challenging that? Why not me? Why not? Yeah. I think the thing is we, in our desire to achieve, kick the goal, whatever it is, okay, we sometimes get in the way of ourselves. And I just think sometimes, put it down, walk away, dun 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 dun, dun bang, right through the middle. Okay, so inside me, I've got it. All I have to do is to find it. I don't have to relearn it. I don't have to be worried too much. And then hopefully coaching is just about, okay, that was perfect. Your non-kicking foot was superb. Your shoulder was so powerful. The posture was awesome. And you're going, oh, gosh, right. So I just need to do that. And, and, and you, you keep going on that. I mean, one of the things that I think was really helpful but partly sadly because of your injury about the hyperextension and how we had to get the kicking foot down so there was no hyperextension particularly on the left side that was a really as it turned out a kind of a godsend in some respects because whereas we would say commit to the ball now we actually had to commit through the ball and several feet beyond it to be able to get our foot down there. So often the kick was left behind. The kick kind of didn't matter. You know, I, I've jogged through it, hit it, and I'm still going, oh, oh, by the way, there's the ball going. Yeah, it, it, the, the kick wasn't the biggest part. The biggest exactly, part was yeah. it was you exploring you and the kick does yeah. its thing and you're too busy being excited about what you're doing next. You forget, oh, I've just done an amazing kick. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But I'm too busy thinking, yeah. what what can I do next? Instead of noticing, you know, what what's trying to define you in a way. Yeah, and I, and I think also there's something within us that like, you like having the power, and we all do it, whether it's hitting golf balls or a cricket bat or tennis, or of just hardly putting anything in and just seeing the ball fly. There is a, an innate kind of, yeah. wow, I, I kind of like that. And, and I'm often with the guys that I'm working with now, I try and hold on to that and, and just say, how did that feel? Did you enjoy yeah. that? You know, and sometimes if it's a bit tense what do, you, what do you mean enjoy it well yeah. wouldn't that feel good and now we we have the science of energy leak where i i call it a zero if there's no energy leak and that's your you go to and then we either leak or we wrap it but yeah it, it's fighting the dwelling on mistakes and oh no yeah. what if i do this and i'm saying no just enjoy it so much of what we've covered on the the podcast so far is about allowing those feelings to just be yeah, and to not get involved in them, just to allow them to be as, as almost they are part of the path, not a wrong turn. And be, the other side of them is new space, but because we keep turning away from them, we never see that new space. So to simply allow them, but you mentioned that effortless genius. And I said, I'd bring this up the first time we get together at age 16, my dad was on the sideline in, in Bristol when I came to see you for the first time and he couldn't stop from laughing every time you kicked the ball. Mostly because he saw my face, how I was looking at the balls you were kicking to me, but also because he was as dumbfounded as me. It just didn't make sense. What you were putting in and what was coming out just didn't compute everything i'd grown up was this thing of kids in the playground saying you know watch this and taking run-ups from the you know from <laughs> 50 yards away and the ball the ball going about 10 yards yeah. and what i was seeing now was someone barely moving and i was having to chase that ball and i'm sure you were kicking it over my head deliberately for me no, to have to keep going and getting it and realize that that it's that is possible and you mentioned no energy leak but i'm thinking from a physical perspective there is efficiency in the mechanics yes in the laws yeah. But you take it one step in, there's the absolute alignment on mental, emotional and deeper levels. And that's what I mean about that great feeling. Yeah. When you're in that immense space, your attention and energy is so aligned. There is zero wastage anywhere. Yeah, and absolutely. What, happens, what happens is dumbfounding 
And then the issue is you then think I have to match that again and you're out of alignment because the first one did not come from comparison. Yeah, yeah. And, and to reset that space of total alignment that says I am not yet realized who I am, what I think yeah. is right and wrong. I don't know this. And to allow yourself to be in that space of saying, therefore, everything has to be right. It has I, to be okay. I, th I think it's interesting you know, you kind of reflect back on that. I, I mean, I, I don't do much kicking now. Occasionally, obviously, just recently, it's a bit difficult. But I find that if I have to demonstrate something and I have to, you know, at least hit it 50 meters or something, I, I forget about what I'm trying to do. And I just know how I want it to feel. And, and it's a kind of a short circuit. You know, I don't tell anybody that, but I, I know what it's going to feel like if I do it right. So this is how I want it to feel. What I align it to, if you can imagine a, a batsman going out to bat and he's just warming up, he's got his pads on and everything, and you say to somebody, right, just give me some throwdowns. And, and the batsman will say, I quote, I just want to get my eye in. Yeah, well, yeah. actually, nothing could be further from the truth because he cannot physically see where the ball is hitting his bat, but he can feel it. And he just wants to feel that powerful half volley. So he knows the feeling that he wants and the feeling dictates the technique, if you see that. Yeah. And I find that with so many other things, the same with chipping, which is another area in golf, which is sometimes people find nightmarish, is actually saying, well, how do you want it to feel? And then it's taken away so that, well, I'm interested in, I just don't want to scuff it, or I don't want to thin it, or, you know, and already you suddenly r rumbled, look, you're never going to hit this cleanly if you're trying to avoid thinning it or scuffing it. This has touched on something quite big for me because the realization that so much of the practice, to the initial side, is about learning the technique and understanding the mechanics. And that continues, obviously, as I became more and more aware from a sensitive perspective, I just became more and more able to access deeper dimensions of what that feeling was. It wasn't just a straightforward, oh, I felt the ball on my foot. There's oh, subtleties yeah. and intricacies and nuances to it. And this is where, because we've had lots of people talked on the podcast already about the law of attraction about being able to embody the receptive feeling of gratitude about what it will feel like to have your dream and then to be that feeling now to attract the dream and what that practice for me represented was you get a bit of a cheat sheet on it because when you're kicking a ball you actually get a physical reminder of what the yeah. feeling is but the problem is, is for me going into the game, I would be too busy on the visual. I watch the ball go through. I watch the ball miss. I watch it instead of just find that feeling and then think, right, brilliant. Got it. Deeply note it, bank it, have it. And then that's your mark of that. Nothing mm. else is as of interest. Whether a hundred went left or right, you have that feeling and yeah. you just embrace that feeling before the next kick. And sure enough, the feeling was where all the intelligence was. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's very interesting how, and I don't know how you could, you could represent it. It'd be very difficult to describe technically how you get a feel, but it's very easy for a feel to control your technique. So the feeling and the, the little game I do with the players, an energy leak, you know, so give me a zero. And it's quite interesting how now, you can say to somebody, okay, right, you hit that one. What was that like? Okay, uh, just escaped a little bit. Okay, well, call that minus one. And then, you know, we go on. And then you suddenly go, right, okay, so you've hit those. Now, instead of hitting it and telling me what it feels like, what I want you to do now is to jump forward and give me a zero. So actually give me the feeling. Yeah. That's the money ball in terms of, of short-circuiting the learning. Yeah, I agree completely. And I remember various things from when we were working together. The sweeter, not harder was a brilliant yeah. one for accessing a deeper dimension. You're talking sweeter. Harder is a physical thing. Yeah. yeah. Sweeter is an inner sensation. It's and that fear. picture is worth endless words you cannot direct someone through logic and thought to that space you just say give me something sweeter not harder 
And another yeah. way of saying that for me was when we used to work on, I want this, just give me something that sounds beautiful. Yes, that's and it's right. A different, yeah. It's a different dimension. Suddenly you're, you're yes. getting those subtleties around <laughs> the concept. But also I play games now with some guys where I'm kind of like, right, we're playing a genius game. So the genius is I put the least in, I get the most out because I have the inner genius. So therefore you're going to compete with each other, not to who gets it through, but who gets the most out with the least in. That's it. So get that's them playing it, yeah. with the swagger coming up to the ball and the... But sure enough, what you reveal is an inner intelligence that knows something that old ideas and beliefs don't. Yeah. And that's where that's where the growth is. Yeah. And and, and the growth is it kind of in its entirety. It's feel is the whole package, you know, and, and I, I, I try to work out why is it more coaches don't use feel. And I've used feel even for, you know, when I work with British judo about the sensation of body and, and so on and about weight moving. And I've used it for fast bowling and for batting. And, and I think that the problem with feel is that some coaches find it very difficult to surrender the assessment to the player. If you tell me, you know, that was quarter out, I can't say, no, it wasn't, because you're the only one that can feel it. So that there has to be a, a kind of a trust. But I think that if you do it long enough, you can pretty well work it out. And people pick up on it very quickly. And I should think that by, if you're working with somebody and you're, you're into that kind of dimension and, and, and that, area that you're working on then i think that you you do trust them yeah that's that's really really powerful for me and and i also think that like i said about your presence in those sessions with me is that feel is a place that's difficult to access if your energy is one of being a bit frustrated fearful or whatever you you want the immediate physical guarantee yeah. you want to say give me something that that's physical because feel is one of those that, that is inspired when you feel great. You don't need someone to say, just feel it. You're already feeling it. Yeah. But that's why I say with so much of the, so many of the sessions that we did, our relationship was so important about having that trust, knowing that you were there for me, irrespective of what happened with selection or whatever with this. Yeah. It was knowing that you were there for me because I remember in the World Cup final 2003, we were warming up and I was hitting those narrow angles, you know, kicking a goal kick from five yards off the try line from only about 10 metres in from touch. It's a very, very narrow angle you're trying to hit the ball through the post. And so you've got a full stadium, Telstra Stadium or whatever it was. And That's right, yeah. And, and I've smashed this narrow angle kick and it's hit the upright full on and come back down the exact trajectory that I'd hit it. And it's just landed right in front of my face and I've caught the ball and in amongst, you know, whatever at that point, 80,000 people, you've looked over at me and I've looked at you and said, that was a bit strange. Wasn't it? And you've looked at me and it's been, we've had a good old laugh about it. <laughs> and sure enough, that laughter yeah. is, is an access to feel because it's yes. a movement away from fear. And, and so many of the sessions we had where I remember I'm just destroying every kick. It's beautiful. I can't, I'm in between the practice kicks, we're talking about anything else yeah. but kicking. Yeah. And it's joy. And people think, but you know, you should get your mind on. You should have your mind on the next kick, but it's not. It's about feed the feel. Yeah. Feed, feed the joy, feed the worthiness. And when there's a moment, like you said, don't lose the worthiness when a ball misses. Just work on, that was amazing what you did there. Beautiful. Feed the feel. Yeah. And that, that accessing feel with a relationship of trust and understanding that maybe during those moments of angst and fear and it, okay, we'll get to the feel. We'll get there. Yeah. Just try. And that's what happened in those sessions I told you about. I'm yeah. angry. I'm frustrated. And by the end of it, I'm saying, let's just sit. Come on, you and me. <laughs> let's go for a walk. Let's go for a walk by, by the river or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because I can recognize that sometimes with golfers where, where they get a particular stat and they've really nailed and covered wedges and they've got, you know, five out of five inside 10 feet from 110 meters and they're kind of looking at it and they see that cluster of balls there and again, wow. And, and, and I sometimes have to say, right, bookmark that, bookmark it. Okay. Because you beat yourself up when you, when you do go in the trees and in the bunkers, but you don't bookmark when it's right. We don't spend enough time reinforcing what's right 
as our starting point. What we do is get cussed because one was a little bit thin and, and was 10 feet away and all the rest were three feet away. And, and I find that that now, compared when we work together, the negative avoidance and finding what's right is a much bigger part of what I do. And I think, I think understanding as well that without challenge, how can you be aware of where your limits are? Yeah. And so there is no, there is no change without that challenge. And if challenge comes in a form that you like, it's not challenge. Yeah. And I think, yeah, we had, we had Henry Fraser on the, the podcast a while back. He was talking about, it's amazing when you look at it, just actually so little with so many people, including myself in our days is going wrong. There's so much that's happening, right? Whether it's the fact the sun's coming up, whether it's the fact that you've got food to eat in the cupboards or whatever yeah. it is. And yet a couple of things that don't, all our attention goes there. Yeah. And when we can move that attention, like I said, to those other things, those smaller things, they just don't have that same power anymore, that influence. I think in a way we, we've we lost our kind of resilience over the minutiae that's not quite right so you know the bus is late <clears throat> well the bus is late so what you know we, we're not like that i think it's our lives today if we're not careful that we we really need to just sort of take it i remember players sometimes saying look it says lunch at 10 past one you know it's quarter past one now where's lunch this is the, the old petersham and so on and because we were so regimented and we thought at that time that was a good thing to be we're kind of making a rod for our own back because we're not going to lose a test match because we had to wait 10 minutes for lunch. And, and the one thing the Marines taught us was what is important? And it was the famous, don't sweat the small stuff. So one of the key phrases always, it's not going to cost us a test match. Yeah. You know, yeah. something wasn't right. You know, the, the projector wasn't quite working for doing the film. It's not going to cost us a test match, you know. Yeah. And I thought that was a very important thing. And I think sometimes in today's world with so much that's going on, which is not particularly comfortable, we're, we're, we're on the edge of that. So any other little thing that we can have a go at, and it's, it's quite a challenge to keep level and spaced and perspective over things that really don't make a lot of difference no exactly and, and that kind of if you like don't sweat the small stuff moving away from the regimented side of it when you said was that really a helpful thing to be now obviously there's lots of things about discipline and understanding game plan and people turning up in the right place when you've got a role to play in it but i remember so much of the stuff we were doing day before a game and even day of a game was still brand new for that same reason, because the moment you start saying, well, we always do this before a game. Well, what are you trying to be in the game? Well, in the game, we want to be spontaneous. So what are we doing in the warm up? Well, we've planned it perfectly. Everyone knows what's happening, what's coming. So you're, you're preparing for predictability to go out there and face unpredictability. And that, yeah, those, those warm ups before games for me were, were still nerve wracking <laughs> because I, I was kind of thinking, you know, how's this going to go? But what it was was a perfect preparation because then I wasn't so worried about how the game was going to go. I was already in that mode. Yeah. I think there's, there's a lot of issues about coaching now and particularly when games become less structured, you know, how structured should you, do the coaching be and so on. And I think it all comes down to mapping human behavior. And what I look at is on, on all the players that I work with, I kind of say, well, okay, what is the match behavior? And a golfer is one shot, one opportunity, and then five minutes, and then another shot completely different, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But every shot is totally accountable. So how do you create practices that manifest that? And that's quite challenging in a, in a way. It's the same with goal kicking, y you know, one shot, one opportunity. So how do we mix and match and get it so that you're fresh on it? And I always remember the, the, the you know, the one that was really seemed to help everybody was getting six red done at the team run on the Friday, finished with a couple of narrow angles, or maybe you've done that before and then just finishing with one or two in front of the post. And we used to say this, the saying, remember, that's one to take to bed with. In other words, that's the kick you dream of. That felt 
just magnificent off your foot. It flew, it didn't deviate, it's kind of almost frozen in time, and you go, yep, yeah, that's my kick. Yeah, just for those who won't be aware of this, six yeah. red was our thing oh, about yes. hitting six kicks from from between the fifteen yard lines, which we always, you know, they were. You, you should be getting these yeah. every time. Yeah, and then your narrow angles were your ones just next to the try line, which were almost trick shots. But yes. actually, they, they became probably six reds in the end themselves, and <laughs> they, they did actually. But, yeah. But, so I want to just look at a little bit deeper, if if you can, at the idea you said before about how we can get in our own way, and then you mentioned about setting up practices for goal kicking just then and this example is one that's really true to me in my experience you're in the middle of the action and it's just going off there's people coming at you from all angles there's voices from your own team coming everywhere the crowd are in the ball is flying the sun's burning from out in too long whatever it is <laughs> and your, your body's already sort of knocked about from the hour you've been playing and everything's happening a million miles an hour and there is nothing but clarity. Yeah. Absolute clarity. And you're working from a space of feel because there's no time for thinking and there's no yeah. need for thinking and you're working feel and visualization. So yes. you're almost seeing the situation one step ahead of realizing it, of actually experiencing it. And it, it might only be a flash. It's a flash. Yeah. And then you get confused between did I know it before it happened? Where's time gone? Yeah. In that zone space. And then the referee's whistle goes and he says, penalty, kick for goal. And you say, we're kicking for goal. And now there isn't chaos. Yeah. And all of a sudden, all you can do is think. The feel's gone. The visualization's gone. Because when you try and visualize, you keep coming back to these silly things. Whereas a minute ago, you could dream a situation yep. unimpeded whereas now you dream the ball going through the post and you keep visualizing it going left <laughs> and you're thinking why am i visualizing <laughs> missing or you start thinking what if this happens and what if this happens you're thinking but why am i self-sabotaging now yeah. when a minute ago when it was so much more of, a, of an unknown situation unpredictable more tricky more more heated yeah. I had clarity and yet yeah. now I have time. I'm doing something I've practiced all my life and now I have no clarity. And a lot of our work was about bringing that clarity yeah. back. But it's so interesting for me that there becomes in that heated space, there's no looking after me. There's just do what needs to be yeah. done. Whereas in the goal kick, there's a looking after me. I'm in the way because I'm now trying to save myself here. Yeah. If I don't get this over, well, who does that matter to? Well, the team. But why does it matter to the team? Well, if they lose, and what does that matter? Well, it, it's yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. It's back it's to me. Back to, yeah. It's my fault. It's my reputation. It's my worth. It's my value. Yeah. And so much of our your your sessions with me, and so much of what I enjoy doing now is is breaking down that space to get mm. the me out the way. Yeah. And I think you've you've written your first book, The Pressure Principle, and it's so interesting that. When the me's not there, there is no pressure. No, no, there isn't. But when the me's there, there's nothing but pressure. And then it's suddenly cope, cope, deal with it, manage it. Yeah. But, but you're like, but well, how do I find that space? Well, I think it's interesting because I did some work with Jamie Cook, who is a modern pentathlete. And one of the things they have in the pentathlon is the biathlon at the end where you run and then you have to stop and fire five shots to get five targets down and so on and so forth so it was really interesting where you're doing something aerobic so you're running and and pretty shifting it's 800 meters i think each one between each set of five shots and we tried to work out ways of preparing for the shooting while you were still running when I mean, you didn't have the gun you know so it wasn't quite running down the alley but it, you're running it and we did all the things about hyperventilation trying to slow down just imagine you're in treacle you know, a few things like that, and then pick the gun up and then and then just squeeze the rounds off, controlling the breathing and, and, and so on. And of course, the, the thing there is if you miss, you stay there till you get it. So you could be miss, miss, and the other guys have put their guns down and they're off, you know. <laughs> so so it, it's horrible. It's, it's, it's but we, ju we just found that to 
just expect it it's quite interesting expectation if you expect it to happen you have a greater chance of it actually happening now when you when you're goal kicking you know if you expect it to go over chances are it will but somehow that when we're in the match and it counts like the the, the shooting then there is the well okay but now now we're under pressure and and so and so's just hit his five and he's already gone and, and i see that so then we start picking the zone you know the target within the target so it becomes the piece of stitching the smallest possible target so what you try and do you don't say because there's no such thing as the verb to forget you can't forget, but you can displace. So if I'm looking at the smallest possible target and I'm really visualizing the line and I'm looking at the actual impact point on the ball and I've already visualized my upright body going through it, you know, I kind of got rid of the clutter because there isn't any room and it's, and it's finding thoughts that are precise and very detailed that actually displace the other thoughts. Yeah, which are more sort of survival, yeah, and survival and looking after me. And yeah. the, so we, we had that expression when we were about the game within a game. That's it, yeah. So a, a, everyone in the crowd is playing the, is he going to get it through? And we're playing the, can I hit that seat? That's right, there? that's right. And I think you're, you're right. And what I think, speaking about that whole kind of that process not outcome idea is that when you're truly in the process there is no me in the process no. there's the process no. you are the, the process you are, you are the process and therefore if you put a me in the process you disrupt the process and to go with those we used to have we called them cues didn't we so you yeah. have your cues from the back of your run up you just had that single bit of stitching that exact sensation of feel whatever it was to be precise in that area that it almost creates that trance like state yeah. where there's nothing else. And people talk about shutting out the crowd. People talk about shutting out. It's, it's not so much you shut it out. It's just that... You just displace it. It's no longer relevant. Yeah, there isn't room. Exactly. And I think, whereas talking about the outcome, outcomes are destinations. They're badges. Yeah. They belong to the me. The me, yeah, the me wants the outcome because it makes me more of me. Yeah, yeah. And it also makes me less of me if, if, it's, the wrong if, if it's the wrong one. Yeah. So, so if the outcome is important, more important than anything else, the me is more important. Yes. And so bringing it down to that immediate focus of, because for what my experience has been from going through a whole career full of injuries and going beyond the career into what's next is the process hasn't stopped. No. Nah. No, it it will never stop. There is no destination where you reach and you say, I did it. And now life's just going to be a piece of cake. It's no, no, the process keeps going. And the process is removing the me to become more, like you said, zero wastage. And then you realize there's a zero, zero wastage. And that's a zero, right. zero, you, you're like, God, what I thought was zero. That's right, yeah. It's actually, I'm, Even, I'm yeah. leaking all over the place. <laughs> Look what I found now in that Exactly, that, yeah. And there's process and process and process, you know. Yeah, but what's been so powerful in simply you not having this idea of what should be, what must be done for me, what is right for me, you know, what, what's good enough, what's not good enough, i.e., allowing me to to own my own potential yeah and not and not to have you dictate it in that way we've done has almost been that in our relationship i felt free to explore free to feel good in any moment because there has been no backstory there's been times we haven't spoken for a while and then we speak again and there is no kind of oh well we haven't spoken for a while so that means it's just straight up it's just straight into it again yeah let's connect and i, and I think that connection is powerful because I mentioned before that you're older, you're uh, yeah, a little bit older than me, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it, at the beginning, I was a 16 year old and I was in the presence of someone that knew what he was talking about and knew what he was doing. And then people talk about it going through a friendship or whatever that stuff, but actually it's not, it's been for me, two energies. Yes. Nothing, nothing to do with human no. characteristics, just two energies serving each other for how both of them need to serve each other at those moments yeah. according to what they're after and it's been a it's been an absolute joy yeah and it's also i think it comes back from that very first thing when i spoke about when you coach or teach 
you're next to the person. When you're instruct, you're in front of the person. And if you bully, you're behind the person. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. But you're sort of saying, look, here's here's the dark unknown, which is where your potential is. I'm going to push you into it, that's right. as opposed to walk with you into it. It's yeah. a slightly different feel. Yeah. So, so I, I think that, and also the other thing is the skill of managing other people's learning and getting to understand their map of reality is a never-ending challenge. And, you know, even with the people that I see that I'm that I know pretty well, uh, I still look at myself and go, right, could I have done that a bit better? Could I have said that a little bit better? But I don't I, I don't think there'll ever be enough. And I don't mean that in the, you know, I want more, I want more, I want more. I think the learning and learning with learners to become more effective learners, I think is never ending. I, I think people are individuals. Every time you come across somebody, they're slightly different. They're, they interpret things differently. They go to a different school or university or they play for a different club and so on. And within there, there's the kind of the cultural bit. And I just find the whole thing just fascinating. And I, I kind of look at people and I go, whoa, how good is that? <laughs> and then only a nanosecond afterwards, but how good could they be? exploring that bridge yeah and never never getting to the end of that bridge exactly and never you're, you're just living on that bridge of how yeah. good could it is and 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 if you get somebody that is dedicated enough and enthusiastic enough and understands that it's not instant then it's a great journey beautiful man that's amazing i think for me one of the things that, that i always found in your presence doing what i love doing despite all these big things going on around us you know what it was like because we were there together facing the the media and all the stuff around the the games and what was going to win the games whether it was going to be goal kicking or drop goals or this or that in our sessions between us i felt free again to dream uninterrupted i felt free again to to in our space on that field to feel worthy enough to say i can dream again yeah without having to dampen the dream down because it'll probably never happen or if i do get there something will slip me up and if things are great there's always a banana skin somewhere and someone's out to get you but just to live in that space of like you said why not and how good could this be yeah and and live in that space so i absolutely get it 100 percent. it's uh you know i understand what a life well lived is because our time i feel i've definitely enjoyed it to the full well, it's not over yet, so let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so much more to come. As so we say, the best is always yet yeah, to come. Yeah, 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 very Brilliant. much so. Dave, thanks so much for, for joining us, mate. And again, for, for me, a pleasure, because I'll get to carry on this journey and, and see where it goes. Yeah, you're welcome. And I'll be looking forward to the next chapter. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Cheers. And just like that, we're at the end of another episode of I Am. I'm so, so grateful to all of you for listening in. I'm enormously keen that this be a two-way conversation. So if you've got any thoughts, questions, ideas, anything that's been inspired by these conversations, anything you just want to get off your chest and get out there, then please send them across in the reviews or just get in touch on social media. I absolutely love holding these types of discussions. I do believe there is no more powerful an opportunity in life than to look at what we can make of our time here on earth, individually and collectively. There's so much scope and depth in these conversations and all the learnings and lessons I do feel are limitless. If you haven't already and you want to know a little bit more about why I'm holding this space and talking to these guests, then do head over to the Tuesday episodes. There I'll explain my journey and my history with these people. I'll also use this time to answer any of your questions, so don't hesitate to get in touch and I'd love it if you'd rate, review, follow and subscribe to the show. Until next week, have a great weekend. Thanks for listening to I Am with me, Johnny Wilkinson. This show is brought to you by Mags Creative. The executive producer is Megan Hill-Smith and our editor is Kit Melson. <laughs>